Sometimes a change in circumstances forces your hand, and if Roy wants his road back off this ground, it's now or never. On this particular piece of ground, we've got quite a lot of grass at the moment. This is going to be cut for hay today, so that's why we're here now. Because as soon as it's cut, unfortunately, all the deer clear off. Um, and I know there's a, a little roebuck here that uh, would be nice to account for before they disappear. And what I'm hoping for is we might have a bit of a, a double day. The bonus is we've had a hell of a trouble here getting on top of the foxes where the grass is so long. Um, and it's always a real favourite time of mine just after the, the, you know, the, uh, the hay has been cut because there's always uh, lots of insects and uh, little mammals and stuff running around in there that uh, they can feed upon once the grass has come down. The grass is incredibly long and is heavy going and we are not being stealth-like so we decide to play the numbers game and sit and wait it out for a bit. Okay, the interesting thing that you always get when you've got paths like this is pretty much all the animals in the area will use it so they'll always walk the path of least resistance. The landowner says that the buck is often seen using this track along the wooded edge. Roy isn't feeling it so we're back wading through the grass. As Roy fears, we bump into a doe yes, and a buck. We can't see him, right, but we can hear him. It looks like we got here and started stalking before the rower got up to feed. Roy gives the buttolo a blow. It might be a bit early for the rut, but because it's been muggy this week, it's worth a go. No reaction, so we move a little further, but the height of the grass really is providing some great row size to cover. I think we need the fallow buck season to start. At least they must have a chance of seeing them. Back to the track and a waiting game. We get comfortable on a mound of spoil. Isn't it funny how the quarry you're not after offers a shot? Anyway, Roy is sure he's spotted some antlers above the grass, but he loses him. An hour and a half passes and the skies darken. Roy makes the decision to break cover. A rain shower might put an end to the morning, so we go on the offensive. Incredibly, we come across a buck feeding just around the bend in the track. He looks up and can't quite make up his mind what we are. Roy carefully gets his rifle on the sticks. Will he stay put for those painfully slow extra couple of seconds, or will he bolt? Roy hits the young buck square in the chest. He was only 20 yards or so away and Roy's really pleased that the sacrifice of a 2.30 a.m. start has not been in vain. We knew this was sort of last chance alone. Just came stalking down and the buck was just feeding, just feeding into the wood there. Um, and luckily just sort of came out to be a bit inquisitive and we got a shot off on him. Roy knows it has dropped, but looks for the blood trail anyway. It's always a good thing just to go and check your outshot, um, you know, and always check your results. Because then in the future, if you get a circumstance where you can't find your deer, um, you can have a look at your blood, see exactly what happened, um, and then decide the best course of action from there. We find the buck 10 yards away in the tall grass. So why did Roy go for the chest shot? Now, obviously, you can see here that I had to take a front on chest shot which is not a shot that I like at all. Um, at that range then I would have been better off taking a neck shot, but there was a couple of problems. One, where the, uh, the grass is so tall I had to come up and then I, was, I only had a very, a very small window in between the grass and then I had an overhanging branch so all I could see was a clear shot at his chest. The way he was looking, he was just about to make us and then he would have probably run straight into the trees and we would have lost him. When we slow the shot down, we can see the chest inflate from the ballistic shock of the bullet. It almost looks as if the trauma is contained within the chest cavity. Actually, I've been quite lucky with this because I'm using um, a ballistic tip and quite a light ballistic tip. It's gone into the chest and uh, given all its energy up in the, uh, in the chest cavity. You can see here that there's no disruption to the gut uh, or the stomach there, so uh, everything's just... Uh, given up inside. The downside though is obviously I was using a, a 243 there. Um, if we'd come across a fallow buck, if we were a little bit later on in the year and fallow were in season, then I would have been very nervous about using this sort of bullet on a body shot with a fallow because they're a much bo a bigger bodied animal. And uh, I would, have, if you've got to take a, 
uh, through the shoulder so up the shot with a, a, a very lightweight ballistic tip, then there is a chance that it'll give it its energy up in the shoulder and not re reach the vital organs. So, you know, you do have to be aware of your bullet and the animals that you're using it against. So a lovely buck, just in the nick of time. All we need to do now is get on with our day and come back 12 hours later when the grass has been cut and the foxes will be out looking for diced wildlife instead of the landowner's chickens for a change. Roy attaches a new bit of kit to his vehicle, which we'll do a proper test on soon. It seems to be an easy way of getting a steady rest with a good arc of fire. This is, uh, it looks like a fantastic invention and uh, I'm really looking forward to trying it out. So we've just come back to the field where um, we were this morning roebuck stalking and they've cut probably a third of it, um, if not a little bit more. And we were just going to see where it had been cut and how far and already there's a, a big dog fox stood right in the middle of the field. So we're just trying to get set up as quickly as we can and uh, get on top of him before he disappears. We head across the mown grass and spot a dog fox over the brow. We leave the vehicle when the fox ambles behind a tree. The cover means we can get much closer and Roy can get on the bipod. The fox drops. The shot was about 100 yards. The first day after the crop has been cut, uh, whether it be hay or a cereal crop, because they're so used to working around and hunting and they're protected and under cover from, uh, from the standing crop, they get into that routine. And then for the first day or two after it's been cut, he was quite oblivious to what was going on and quite happy to be out and feeding. It would seem this old boy has had a good innings. Now, I know on this ground that there has been a fox that is incredibly lamp shy. And uh, I presumed it to be a, an old fox. And looking at the teeth already, it looks like it might be our boy. So, uh, I mean, you can see by his condition as well, he's not, not fantastic. He's a, I mean, he's all right, but uh, not wonderful. He's just uh, heavily in molt at the moment, which doesn't help his looks. But if you come and look at his teeth, it really does show. God, look at that. That really does show how bad that is. I mean, that, that tooth is completely eroded there. Um, all the rest of his canines are gone, or going, and his lower canines are gone as well. And so, again, on this property, we've had a hell of a lot of trouble with a fox doing chickens. And uh, I think this is probably our culprit. With eyelids being propped open by matchsticks, we have another couple of goes and give the silver fox a blow. But enough is enough. Roy has put the hours in today, keeping the landowner happy. And let's hope we get an invite to Shea Lupton for those roe burgers.